My name is Reyer Senes, and today is February 26, 2024. I'm here at Pew Hall conducting an oral history interview with Carl Van Ness, the retired university historian of the University of Florida. Can you begin by introducing yourself, when and where you were born, and describing your experience growing up? Sure. I'm Carl Van Ness, and I was born uh, January 28, 1953, in St. Luke's Hospital in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, yes. All right. Um, can you describe your family growing up? Did you have any siblings? Or did you have any parents? What were their careers? Yes, uh, I have one brother, uh, Mark. Um, parents, yes, of course. Uh, my father, uh, my parents are rather interesting, or were interesting, they're deceased, um, but uh, they were interesting. Uh, we, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, and Jacksonville, Florida at that time was a very conservative place. My parents were very liberal. Uh, uh, very left wing, in fact. So, yeah. Uh, and uh, my father had been involved with a lot of left wing uh, organizations and, and uh, activities uh, prior to World War II. Uh, he had a rather eventful life. He spent a lot of time as a sailor, uh, went around the world several times, I'm sure. Uh, but he lived in China for a while and uh, he was in China in, uh, in December of 1941 in Hong Kong when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, they, they attacked Hong Kong uh, a day later, and my father was interned uh, by the Japanese for a while. He and about 11 or 12 other people escaped from the internment camp, uh, spent uh, months uh, traversing the distance between Hong Kong and the Allied lines. It took a long time to get back and get to where they needed to be safe. Uh, then spent the uh, next part of the war as a mechanic for China Air National, um, where he was fixing planes that were going over the hump in the Himalayas. And uh, at one point he was in China, and they asked him to go to India. So he had to go over the, <laughs> over the hump in one of those planes. Uh, then he spent some time in, in, Indi in India, and then at one point, he, it was around 1943, he realized that you know, he wasn't really, he was involved in the war, but he wasn't, you know, he wanted to do more, so he decided to return to the United States and enlist. Um, and when, when he got there, and they realized he'd escaped from an internment camp, he spent a time, <laughs> good deal of time in Washington, D.C., being interviewed about his experiences in the internment camp. And then they found out that he was an aviation mechanic and said, oh my God, we really need aviation mechanics. So he spent the remainder of the war in San Francisco. So he never saw any action <laughs> as, a, as an actual member of the military. So all of his action as a civilian being, you know, um, imprisoned by the Japanese and then escaping and doing all that. So my mother uh, is a, was a German Jew. She came to the United States in 1937. Uh, she was very lucky. She. Uh, she was an orphan. She grew up uh, in a uh, Jewish orphanage in Hanover. And uh, the people who ran the, the, um, the orphanage, uh, Leo and Anna Grumbaum, uh, were, you know, they understood what was going on in Germany. Uh, and they managed to get every single child uh, out of uh, the orphanage and adopted elsewhere. Unfortunately, many of them were adopted by uh, families or families in France. Her best friend uh, was adopted by someone in Holland and did not escape the war. She died at Bergen-Belsen uh, in, in the final stages of the war. And my mother was lucky. She was adopted by uh, uh, people from, from New York. And she grew up there, spent the rest of her life in New York. My parents met in New York and got married, uh, moved to Florida. My, my father's actually from Florida, grew up in Sanford, Florida, he was born in 1909. So he returned home, and they spent the rest of their life in Florida, as did I. <laughs> I I've never actually left Florida for any long period of time. Yes. And what were the names of your mother and father? Uh, Parker Alfred Van Ness. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother's name, well, her birth name would have been Renata Ursula uh, Lebowski. Her uh, adopted name, she changed Renata. She didn't like the German stuff. <laughs> uh, so she changed it to Renee. Uh, so Renee Ursula Gill it was her adopted name. Mm -hmm. And um, could you describe growing up in Jacksonville and did your parents' careers or experience influence how they raised you? Oh, absolutely. But in terms of 
uh, Jacksonville, Florida, again, is a very conservative place. I was very liberal. I was not religious. Everybody else was religious. Uh, I wasn't even religious in a Jewish sense, you know, even though I'm you know, technically speaking a Jew. Uh, I, you know, I had no religious background whatsoever. Um, so there was a certain period of alienation where I was not really accepted by other kids. You know, there was just like, oh, you're the, you're the guy who uh, is in favor of civil rights and integration. You know, I was called an in-lover many times. Uh, actually bullied uh, for that as well. Um, so there was, it was a difficult period for a while. Um, but then by that time I was a junior, things started to change in Jacksonville. You had the whole drug culture and people's attitudes started to change. So it was kind of strange because all of a sudden I was very popular <laughs> in my senior year, whereas before that it was like, yeah. You know, so, uh, but yeah, my, no, my parents, uh, you know, gave me very strong values about, you know, fairness and, uh, and uh, justice and, uh, you, know, you had to do what you, you felt was right. So, and uh, so. Yeah. Um, you mentioned your father was involved in some left wing organizations. Mm -hmm. So, when you were growing up, or maybe even a little bit before, do you know uh, any of his involvements in political activities? Did he um, ever come up in the household at all? Did he do what? I'm sorry. Or did those activities ever come up in the household at all, like organizing? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, my parents were very vocal about, you know, current events. <laughs> so, you know, when things would happen, like with, you know, in the civil rights movement with the, you know, Pettus Bridge and all that and, and, and the bombings, uh, you know, I heard a lot about that uh, and I got their opinions about what was going on in the world. Uh, in terms of actual things he did, Politically, no, I don't. I don't know how much he was involved with organizations. I couldn't tell you if he was like a member of the Communist Party or anything <laughs> like that. But he was certainly sympathetic mm -hmm. uh, to the party. Um, but uh, I know that both of them were involved with uh, left-wing politics in New York. Uh, both were uh, active in the uh, campaigns of Vito Marcantonio, who was a member of the American Labor Party, and he represented, um, I can't remember what district he was in, but it would have included the Bronx, part of Harlem, Spanish Harlem maybe, um, part of Manhattan. And uh, so they were involved with those campaigns. Uh, yeah, so, but I, I don't have any specific knowledge about what he may or may not have been involved with. I didn't go too far into it. I mean, we talked politics, but I never really asked him the big questions. Where you were ever on this party. That did not happen. So. All right. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned like a shift in junior year of high school. Yeah. yeah um, could yeah. you describe your educational experience growing up? So like your elementary, middle okay. school, high school I, experience? I uh, attended Central Riverside Elementary, which still exists. Uh, and I attended John Gorey um, Junior High School, which no longer exists, is now a condominium. Uh, interesting. I thought they did a great job with it too, by the way. Um, and I attended what is now Riverside High School, which was Lee High School. And I graduated in 1971. Uh, interestingly, Sam Proctor, who was the first university historian, also graduated from Lee High School uh, back in the 1930s. So there's some continuity there. Total coincidence. But. <laughs> All right. Could you describe some formative experiences um, growing up? You mm -hmm. mentioned like um, a lot of students would bully you a lot for being in support of left-wing yeah. ideas or civil rights. Yeah. Um, are there any specific memories that stand out to you? Well, some of the memories are actually kind of positive. Uh, I had some really good teachers over the years, um, but I do have one memory that kind of influenced my life. And I look back on it and I go, oh, okay. I can see where I was going with that. Uh, but in, my, in the sixth grade, this was before we, you know, was there, you didn't have middle school in those days. You had uh, elementary school, which was grades one through six. You didn't have kindergarten. And then uh, junior high school, which would have been uh, seventh, eighth, and ninth. And then high school, 10th and 11th, 12th. So in my sixth, uh, sixth year, um, sixth grade, uh, at that time, all the boys would join the guard, the uh, crossing guards, you know, the guys who wore the badges and all that stuff. And the girls would be assigned uh, office duties and that kind of thing. It was kind of like an honor, you know, as, uh, as, as you left elementary school. Uh, but uh, I was called into the principal's office um, just at the end of uh, the fifth grade. And, uh, and then it was the principal and the librarian, Mrs. Cox, or Ms. Cox. And 
they, they started off the conversation by saying, Carl, we noticed you spent a lot of time on the library. And uh, we were wondering if you, instead of you know, joining the other boys in, in the guard, if you'd want to be, spend your time in the library. And I said, absolutely, of course I would. I had no idea that I was doing something different, and <laughs> kind of radical, because it's not something that boys did. That would be an assignment that would normally be given uh, to one of the girls. And, but I enjoyed it tremendously. And uh, I was a bit of a ham in those days, too. I also uh, was in a drama club, uh, not a school drama club, but like a community drama club. So I was a bit of a ham, and I loved reading to the kids, uh, that kind of thing. And, um, but uh, looking back on it, I realized, oh, you know, here I was in the sixth grade deciding I wanted to be a librarian, and then I end up you know, being a librarian. So. Um, and growing up and like in this general time period, what were attitudes like towards um, gender? And you mentioned race a bit before, but if you could elaborate on that, like the conservatism of Jacksonville. Uh, I'm just, you know, I'm typical of the Deep South. Uh, you know, uh, I do have some other memories uh, about when, as things were changing. I remember, I guess I was in, so I must have been like 15 or 16. Tommy Lyle had just gotten his driver's license. Driver's license. Well, it wasn't his full driver's license. It was his uh, restricted license. And I was downtown waiting at a bus, bus stop. And then Tommy saw me. And he pulled over. And he had his grandmother next to him uh, in the car. And um, so I got in the back. And we didn't go too much further down. And we passed the Center Theater in Jacksonville, which is in downtown Jacksonville. And the people were coming out. And this would have been probably like 1968, 1969. And this, an interracial couple, not really a couple, but it, two women, black and white, came out of the theater, obviously good friends and laughing and enjoying their company. His grandmother said something about that and in a disrespectful way. Tommy, to my astonishment, says to his grandmother, he said, Grandma, we don't talk that way anymore. We don't use those kind of words. And then she apologized. And I'm just sitting in the back of his car going, wow, I just heard Tommy Lyle tell his grandmother <laughs> that she couldn't be a racist. So it was you know, another indication of how things were changing in the, in the South. But yeah, no, like I said before, you know, I heard uh, the, the N word all the time uh, growing up. Uh, so it was. Uh, an odd situation. In terms of gender, uh, you know, I don't know really. You know, I, it was typical of the South. You know, women were expected to do one thing and take courses and uh, the, you know, like domestic science, that kind of thing, typing. I always wished I could take typing. I wish I had taken typing, typing. But, uh, uh, but I don't know. I really couldn't comment too much there. So, Right. And so you mentioned sort of getting this love of libraries very early on. Um, that came from my mother. Huh? She was uh, big on history. And my love of history comes from my mother. She was very much uh, a Grecophile. She, she just loved ancient Greece. She loved ancient history in general. But she loved history uh, in general. And she was always encouraging me to read. Uh, and I read a lot of history. I didn't read a lot of fiction, never have. Mostly read nonfiction, mostly as a kid, even as a kid, reading history. So, yeah, so did that affect um, your decision to go to university? Like, did you decide to major in history? Or like, what university did you attend? Well, OK, that's interesting. Uh, so in 1970, when I graduated in 1971, I really didn't want to go to college. And I tried to uh, get out of that. Uh, but my mother, being a good Jewish mother, uh, wouldn't accept that at all. Uh, and started crying. You know, you have to go to college. You know, you must do this. So I relented. Uh, I went to FSU for one year. Uh, did not go well. Uh, I quit um, and spent a year working in my. I didn't even mention my parents owned an appliance store. Uh, I spent the next year working uh, in their appliance store. Uh, so decide, okay, I'll, I'll go back to school. Went back to school for a while. Uh, but then again, I just, just couldn't decide what I wanted to do. I was a history major, technically. And I took a lot of history classes. But I, 
I just had problems in, in, in college at first. I just didn't, didn't want to be there, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. It was the 1970s, there was a lot of that going on. People would you know, leave college, go back, leave, come back, you know, and that kind of had to find yourself and all that. So I spent a lot of time finding myself. <clears throat> I think it, <clears throat> I, um, I quit college again in 73 or 74. And then I went through what I refer to as my Jack Kerouac years, where I just kind of like, you know, I worked factory jobs, that kind of thing. Uh, then after a while, though, I just got tired of that life and decided, OK, I'll go back to school. Uh, I started taking night classes at the University of South Florida and finally graduated in 83, 12 years behind. But so <laughs> that's my educational experience as an undergraduate. Could you describe your time as an undergraduate in all these different campuses? Yeah, sure. So I spent a lot of my time at FSU uh, involved in political activity, the anti-war movement, uh, civil rights movement, uh, various causes. I, I called myself an anarchist for <laughs> a couple of years, called myself a Maoist for a few years. Uh, I was involved in a lot of different things. Um, I actually went to China. Uh, I think it might have been later when I left. Uh, Tallahassee, because I went to China, I think, in 75, 1975. I was part of a delegation of Southern whatever people. It was from the U.S.-China People's Friendship Association, which was an uh, organization active uh, trying to get the United States to end its policies towards China and, and reestablish normal relations. So I went to China like, like a year after Nixon made his famous visit to China um, as part of a group that went there. and. Uh, so that's the kind of thing I was involved in. Um, do you have any names of the organizations you worked around or worked with? Oh, well, besides the U.S.-China People's Friendship Association, <clears throat> uh, God, I can't remember any of the names we had. I was also involved with the 1972 demonstrations in Miami, uh, yeah, the, the demonstrations revolving around the Democratic Party's convention and the Republic. They both met in Miami that year. And so I was involved with the organization that was responsible for the demonstrations. Uh, I don't remember the name, actual name of the organization, though. We had a name, but I don't remember. But that was a true that the left in those days, you know, people, organizations would be formed. You'd, and like I said, I was an anarchist for a couple of years. Anarchists did not have any organizations whatsoever. So. Uh, all right. But I can tell you some of the people who influenced me, uh, people that I uh, met. Uh, one of them, the anarchist Murray Bookchin uh, from Vermont. Well, actually, at that time, he was from New York. He's still living in New York City. He later moved to Vermont. Um, but uh, he, he influenced me to a, lot of, a great extent in terms of my, my thinking. I'm still very much a, a social libertarian. I'm, you know, I was a doctrinaire Marxist for a couple of years, I guess. but. Uh, for the most part, I've been more of a social libertarian than anything else. So, All right. And so what did you decide to do when you finished your undergraduate degree at um, USF? Uh, about the same time I got married. Well, we weren't married yet. We were still engaged. We, get mar we got married a year, year later. So I graduated in 83. My wife was going to law school here. So I actually trailed her. And uh, she uh, was admitted. Uh, we, so for the next three years, I was a grad student in the history department, got my MA in Latin American history. Uh, and then, well, there's a long story here. But <laughs> the first year I was here, I taught a class called American Institutions. And it was not a pleasant experience. Uh, the class was very unstructured, uh, kind of chaotic. Uh, there was like really no syllabus. I didn't know anything about the class at the time. Um, but I was asked to teach this class and it had a very thin text. And I just, it was a very bad experience. I just had a very difficult time creating lectures that were relevant to the class. And I just had a hard time getting through my first year uh, because of that, the whole experience of having to teach this class, which I hated. I loved the graduate courses, I loved the coursework, but um, I hated teaching. So at the end of the first year, I was like, um, I'm never going to be able to do this. I cannot pursue a normal academic career. I really cannot uh, imagine ever doing this, you know, having to teach and be in front of a class, classroom every day. Uh, but fortune smiled. 
Um, after that first year, I got a temporary position in the library uh, to process a collection that they had just received related to the Cuban sugar industry. Um, and my thesis was on Cuban railroad construction. So I like, was a natural hire. They, you know, they, oh, you'd be perfect, you know. And it was a temporary position I had for six months. And at the end of six months, I got another temporary position for six months. And after that, I was on a grant um, for two years. And then I was on kind of what I refer to as funny money. They just whatever money they could find to support me. Uh, eventually, though, I think it was, mm, uh, trying to remember exactly when, probably 88, I finally got a tenure accruing position in the libraries. Um, what was I gonna say about that? It was something else, I can't remember, but go ahead, you have another question? Yeah, so what made you interested specifically in Latin American studies and writing a thesis on Cuba? Yeah, thank you. Um, so one of the professors that I took, uh, had classes with a lot at the University of South Florida uh, was Lou Paris. And uh, Lou taught, he was a uh, prominent historian of Cuban, modern Cuban history. I took a lot of classes with him. And I, at that point, I realized I wanted to do something uh, connected to US-Cuban relations. Uh, so when I came here, I already had this idea of what I wanted to do. In fact, it was uh, Dr. Perez was the one who uh, advised me that there was all these documents related to railroad construction and the State Department records, and I should do look at that. So I came here already having this clear idea of what I wanted to write my thesis on. Um, so that's why I was interested in Latin America. It wasn't so much Latin American history. It was actually diplomatic history. But I don't know why, but I ended up taking a lot of classes in Latin American history. And so my degree is actually in Latin American history specifically, as opposed to just American history. But I took a lot of uh, classes with Bob McMahon, at, uh, who taught uh, US foreign relations as well. I took a lot of classes with him. Um, so that's why, I, that's, why I was invo that's why I came into the Latin American Center as a, just opposed to general modern American history. Yeah, and so you mentioned um, getting this job, um, sort of curating this collection yeah. on Cuban sugar. Yeah, and day one, mm -hmm. day one of the job, I realized this is what I want to do with my life. I was just absolutely, it was just so exciting to be the first person to open these boxes of records. And this is an amazing collection, by the way. It's called the Braga Brothers Collection. And it's, it's an amazing collection. And I was just finding all this material. And again, I knew the background behind the, this collection. And it was just, and one of the first things I did was I wrote a, let, wrote a letter to Dr. Perez. Hey, we got this great collection. You should come up and look at it. And he did. And he said, wow, this is a great collection. Um, but uh, I, I just, it was just the, the thrill, you know, of just coming in every day and opening those boxes and being the first person and having to, you know, describe to, to future generations and uh, historians, you know, what was in these collections and what was important and what was not important, you know, and having to make the decisions about what's going to be kept, what's not going to be kept. Um, it, it just, I, I knew I wanted to do that. And that's what I did for the next 38 years. So. <laughs> That's amazing. So um, are, were there any professors or classes that stood out to you when you were at UF or as well like in your undergraduate? You mentioned a couple already. Yeah, I, I took classes with Bobby Mann and uh, uh, Lyle uh, McAllister uh, was a great influence in my life. Uh, like I told you, I had all these problems teaching and Lyle was in charge of graduate students at that time and he really talked me through it. <laughs> I was ready to quit. I was really ready to quit. I just could not take it. Uh, but you know, he talked me through it. Uh, so I was always grateful to him. Um, Lyle McAllister, um, yeah, uh, Macaulay, Neil Macaulay, uh, took a lot of classes with him, who taught both Cuban history, but mostly Brazilian history. In fact, he was famous because he had been uh, involved with uh, the Fidelistas. Uh, during the Cuban Revolution, he actually fought with Fidel's men yeah, in Cuba. So he became this kind of like expert on Cuba. Everybody saw him as a Cubanist, but he would always tell you, no, I'm a Brazilianist. <laughs> Cuba's unimportant. Brazil is important. Brazil is this really large country. That is, you, know, he, you know, he foresaw what was going to happen in Brazil, and Brazil being a dynamic economic power. So, um, so I took a lot of classes with Neil Macaulay as well. And um, were there any 
campus involvements you had at UF? You mentioned doing a lot in undergrad, but what about your graduate school? No, as a graduate student, I was not involved with any kind of political organizations or anything like that. Besides, this is about the 1980s by that time. Um, my last couple of years at USF, I was involved with an organization called the Progressive Student Union. So my politics had kind of tempered and gone through my anarchist phase, my Marxist phase. So now I'm kind of like a social democratic uh, phase. And uh, so I was calling myself a progressive rather than a, you know, a Marxist. So I was, I was involved loosely with organizations in, at USF. Um, but here, no, as a grad student, I was too busy being a grad student. Mm -hmm. And I got married. And as soon as I got insurance, my wife decided she was going to get pregnant. So <laughs> could you describe? Was, it was like, you've got insurance, and it's going to pay for a pregnancy. We're going to get pregnant. Uh, yeah. Could you talk a bit more about your wife, how you met, and sort of following her? I met her in uh, an English class at the University of South Florida. And it was a really weird experience. Um, I was taking this English class. It was uh, not, uh, writing for nonfiction, whatever they call that. And so we had, you know, your assignments, we had to write something. And I had written this essay uh, about my childhood, some of my childhood experiences. And the teacher was just so impressed with this essay that I had written. She decided to read it out loud to the class. Uh, it was a little embarrassing, but. The woman next to me, uh, who would later be my wife, Laurel Davis, uh, just she, she had to know who this person was that had written this essay. So she called me up, and we set a date, and the rest was history, so to speak. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I had two kids. Uh -huh. So. Oh, wait, what's your wife's name? Uh, she died, actually, in 2017. Oh. Uh, from cancer, non-smokers, cancer. So, yeah. Okay. Um, does she, um, do you have her name, and could you spell it? Uh, Laurel, mm -hmm. L-A-U-R-E-L Davis. All right. And um, you mentioned during grad school, um, you had a lot of temporary jobs. Did you cur curate a lot of other collections, and do any particular items stand out to you during this point? Yeah, there were a lot of collections that stood out. Uh, after I was finished with the, uh, the Braga Brothers collection, actually, I was never finished with it because it was so massive. For the rest of my 38 years, I continued to work on that collection. Uh, but uh, in those years, I was mostly involved with the university archives. Carla Summers uh, was the university archivist. She was the one who hired me. A debt of gratitude to her. I can't even express you know, my, <laughs> that, that gratitude. Um, but uh, we dealt, dealt with a lot of uh, university records, you know, presidents of, I mean, records of past presidents and uh, that kind of thing, deans, various uh, organizations, student organizations, student government. I process most of the student government records. Um, also, uh, a lot of faculty papers, uh, and there were a number of in very interesting faculty papers and faculty collections. One of them I'm working on right now uh, in retirement uh, was that the papers of William Graves Carlton, who was known as on campus as Wild Bill Carlton. He was a revered professor at the University of Florida. He estimated that he taught to about 3,000 students each year for a period of time. His lectures were in, given in the university auditorium, and he packed the university auditorium. Of course, his classes were also mandatory uh, as part of uh, the American institutions. That same class that I took that I talked about that really drove me nuts, well, it turns out that Carlton was the guy who basically invented American institutions. But instead of a rather unstructured, chaotic class, his classes were very structured. They had a you know, defined syllabus. They wrote their own texts for the class. Uh, and there were defined lectures, so anybody he would do a lecture, but then there would be another instruct, instructor who would do most of the classes. So he did like a, a lect, one lecture per week for the class. Um, so, but it, so it was a totally different thing. It was a mandatory class. It was part of the university college, which was the college for freshmen and uh, sophomores. And uh, so you, you had to go through American institutions. You had to take the social science classes. You had to take the basic science classes. You had to take basic English and all that. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd love to touch on Carlton more, and we will in the future. But okay. I'm curious. So, like, doing a little like 
popcorn style approach. I know yeah. there's a lot of interesting items in the collections. Like I know there's a biscuit that was mentioned in an article um, about you. Like the you biscuit know. precedes me. The biscuit uh -huh. came many, many years ago. That was from the Sam Proctor years when he mm -hmm. was a uh, university historian, but he also kind of, kind of acted as the university archivist in a way. Uh, he never had that position, um, but he was responsible for creating the archives in the first place. And it was part of the university's uh, centennial celebrations in 1953. So in anticipation of that, they decided, the university decided, oh, okay, we're going to establish an archive for the university. And Sam Proctor was the, the primary person who organized that and gathered up some of the, the, the original records. So a lot of people donated things uh, during that period of time. I'm not exactly sure when the biscuit arrived, but uh, the biscuit has an interesting story. Supposedly, it was uh, mailed uh, from the University of Florida. It was a biscuit from the cafeteria, or the mess hall, as they called it at the time, because we're talking, I forget what the date on that biscuit is. I think it's 1913 or something like that. Um, and mailed to a friend in Georgia. And I don't know that the thing was actually mailed. There is a stamp on it, but the stamp is, doesn't have any cancellation. So maybe it wasn't mailed. It could have been just like one of those school prank type things. But it's just kind of interesting that there is this biscuit <laughs> in, the, uh, in the archives. And yeah, we, we, whenever we do, do classes and that kind of thing, we'd always bring out the biscuit. I always got a, got a good laugh from everybody. So, Are there any but there's some other items as well that, you know, in collections besides Carlton. Uh, I had some interesting experiences. Uh, I remember one time there was this professor who had died uh, rather suddenly, and he left his papers in the office. He was, uh, I guess he would have been either psych, I guess it was psychology. He was in psychology. He was in the psychology department. And so they asked us to <clears throat> go ga uh, gather up his papers. We did. And then Carla asked me to process the collection. And I started doing some research on to, to Mr. Kramer. Saul Kramer was his name. And I couldn't really come up with anything. People kept telling me, oh, he's a really strange guy. And I kept getting that a lot. And, but you know, no, he wasn't really that important. His research didn't really go anywhere. And so I was in the process of actually deaccessioning the collection, throwing it away. And luckily, I don't just deaccession in total, you know, just throw away everything. I kind of go through the materials as I'm deaccessioning. And I saw these folders related to the Oregon Institute in Maine. And I realized, oh, wait a minute, this is connected to Wilhelm Reich. And I remember taking, uh, attending lectures by uh, Murray Bookchin concerning Wilhelm Reich. So I knew who this guy was. I knew he was really, you know, an important person in terms of uh, uh, philosophy and that kind of thing and, and, and uh, psychology. Um, so I, I started I, I immediately, immediately pulling things out of the garbage can and realized I had, you know, had some decent materials here related to, to Reich's lectures that he gave in, uh, in Maine. And uh, so I saved that collection. Um, and then you know, got a little bit of use too. From, there was a, a lot of Reich scholars and they were really interested because this guy had taken copious notes of uh, uh, when he was uh, attending the lectures. So are there interesting any, things like that. Are there any other items that stand out to you? Uh, God, what else did we, we used a lot of different things. There are also like the rat caps, the freshman beanies that freshmen were required to wear uh, prior to World War II, and then after World War II for a period of time. Uh, so we have a, quite a collection. We got our first one. I can't remember. We didn't have a, we didn't have a uh, beanie until, uh, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he, this guy had his beanie still, and he donated his beanie. We were so happy. Now we had a, we had a, a rat cap. And then rat caps just start appearing <laughs> left and right. People would say, oh, yeah, I got a rat cap, too. You know? I think we've got like a box of rat, rat caps now, you know, just full of, full of rat caps. So, uh, but they're kind of an interesting too, because it, it, it speaks to a, a earlier generations who attended the University of Florida, a totally different culture, a totally different climate than what exists today. So, and uh, yeah, those are interesting. I, I, students today, you know, you tell them what freshmen had to, had to do, and they had to go through. You know, why do that? You know, it's like, oh, it's just a tradition, you know, and it's what people had to do. It was a way of bonding, you know, so. Yeah. 
Um, Samuel Proctor was your predecessor as mm -hmm. the university historian. Did you ever interact with him personally? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and in fact, uh, as you know, as both university archivist and university historian, I got a lot of reference questions from outside the university, but also from within the university, asking, "Okay, Carl, when? Why is this road named this? You know, well, that kind of thing." Uh, Sam got the same kind of questions. And a lot of times he would call the, the archives and ask, you know, okay, can you look this up for us? So, yeah, we had to do a lot of research for him, but, uh, yeah. And um, who is the Alice in Lake Alice? Uh, yes, we used to get that question all the time. I don't remember now. Um, it was somebody, the daughter of somebody who owned the property, but I don't remember her name. But. For years, it was a mystery, and we had all sorts of theories as to who Alice was, and then finally somebody figured it out. All right, and so uh, what was this transition like from grad student to archivist to university historian? You mentioned you got like a tenured track position. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, originally I had, had this idea that I was going to pursue a PhD, um, but then I was told that I, in order to have a faculty position in the library, I had to have a library science degree. So I had to go back to library school to get a master's in library science. Uh, it was through an extension uh, courses via Florida State uh, University, because the University of Florida does not have a library science program. The reason for that is because uh, Florida State used to be the state college for women. So when they were parceling out you know, where different programs would go prior to 1947, uh, you know, things like the College of Law it obviously came to the University of Florida because in those days women were not encouraged to become lawyers. Uh, same thing with the business school. Um, when it came, it came time to establish a business school, it came to the University of Florida. But certain programs ended up in uh, Tallahassee, library science being one of them because it's predominantly female. And, you know, at the time, you know, well, men didn't want to become librarians, you know. Um, so that's why the library science program is at Tallahassee. But anyway, yeah, I ended up getting a degree, my master's degree from, uh, from FSU. Uh, and then after going, getting that, I was just like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to grad school anymore. I'm done with that. And I had a nice job in the, uh, in the library, so I didn't feel like it was necessary to get a PhD. All right. Times have changed, though, in the library. You know, when I came here, uh, the library science degree was like the required course. And shortly thereafter, after I got mine, they decided, nah, maybe it isn't necessary for everybody to have a library science degree. So a lot of our, our recent hires in special collections, they didn't necessarily, the people didn't necessarily have a library science degree. They would probably have a PhD in history uh, or English, uh, that kind of thing. And so I was one of the, the I think I was one of the last people who was required to get a library science degree. Right. And how did you come to receive the designation of university historian? Well, it was about a year after Sam died. Uh, it was after we also we had uh, finished the sesquicentennial celebration. So Sam was around for both centennial and sesquicentennial. Uh, and I, had gotten, I was heavily involved in the sesquicentennial uh, celebration and had co-written a, a pictorial history with Kevin McCarthy. Um, I'd already had to establish a reputation as somebody on campus who knew the university's history. And before he died, uh, I didn't know this at the time, I was told this by Mike Gannon later, uh, Sam had talked to people in the administration and said, when, you know, after I'm gone, uh, Carl should be the university historian if you want to continue that post. And um, it was done as a surprise. I was attending uh, one of our meetings for the sesquicentennial committee. It was actually after the committee. Um, we established something called the University History Advisory Committee. And we were having a meeting, and then all of a sudden, a bunch of people came in, <laughs> including the dean of the library and uh, some high-ranking officials from the university. And they told me I was now the university historian if I accepted the position. So, of course, I, of course I accepted it. So what made you interested in university history? You mentioned doing Latin American history, but like UF history. Well, you know, I, 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 as soon as I, I was the assistant university archivist for a number of years, 
And then in 1997, I was appointed the university archivist, held that position, I forget how long. Um, as the archivist, you need to know something about the history. I mean, even to process the collections. Well, like for example, going back to Carleton, in order to process his papers, I need to know something about William Graves Carleton. I didn't know anything about him. I didn't know about Wild Bill Carleton and all this, and all the, and all the materials that he had written, all the people that he had influenced. Also didn't know that he was gay. Found out that out later, he was gay. Um, so you have to do the research to do that. In order to d work with any collection, um, the same thing with the Brogger Brothers collection. Uh, later on, I did a lot of work with political papers. So I, you know, I had to learn, get involved with uh, Lot and Clot, Giles's life, and, uh, and learn everything I could find out about him to, in order to process his papers. It's that way with any collection, whenever you're dealing with archival material. In order to do a good job, you really have to know the context of the records, you know, what is happening during this period of time. So I process, processed a lot of materials uh, in the university archives, and every time, you know, I had to research on the, the origins of the College of Engineering, I do a lot of work on that. Agricultural um, materials, one of the things we did when I, soon after I came here, we did a survey of uh, records uh, that were still in existence in people's offices and stuff like that, or stored away. And we discovered that there were records going back to the 1880s. This is in the 1980s when we're doing the survey. Going back to the 1880s, that IFAS was keeping, and they were stored in you know, storage sheds. At one time, I went into uh, Newell Hall, and I was do surveying the records there. And this woman says, would you like to see the stuff in the attic? And I'm going, sure, you know. And then I realized, oh my god, they had all the, uh, the, the records related to the county extension program going back to the years when it was originated in 1917. I mean, it was like dozens and dozens of boxes related to the extension program. We eventually got a grant to process all that material, but that was just, just amazing to find that these records still existed in people's offices. <laughs> so. All right, and, um, and and again to process all those materials, I had to know something about agricultural history. Luckily, I'd already done sugar <laughs> with Cuba, so uh, it was kind of a natural thing. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I had to do a lot of research on who all these people, who was Wilmot Newell, you know, who's who are all these other people. So, what topics about U of history sort of particularly interested you? God, that's, that's a hard one because they all, everything interests me. But I think student life and student culture, because that's a hard one for, for an archive. Because outside of student government and the vice president for student affairs and his, predecessor, or his or her predecessors, there's really not a lot. Because students don't generate a lot of records. I mean, they do create organizations. Most of these organizations don't keep records. Uh, so it's very difficult to uh, get a, a grasp on student life. Because I couldn't just you know, open up the archives and go, OK, what, what's happening? Because there's no archives. You know? uh, so that's something that's always fascinated me. And I got very much involved in some of the myths about uh, our, our, our past. Um, particularly things like the origins of the Gator uh, nickname, uh, the school colors. So we had a lot of stories about that, you know, people's from oral history and that kind of thing, uh, or from their memoirs talking about the past. But I was constantly finding that, that those memories were inaccurate. You know, that wasn't exactly what happened. People would have, you know, nobody has a perfect memory. I don't have a perfect memory. You don't have a perfect memory. And um, so I started to do a lot of research on various aspects of uh, student culture here. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And I got a very good grasp of what it was like to be a student here in the early years as a result of that research. So to me, that was probably the most interesting thing. Could you go over a couple of those myths? Yeah, sure. Uh, so when I got here, we already had an origin story for the Gator nickname and involved uh, the Miller family. 
Austin Miller and his father, Philip Miller. Um, Philip Miller owned a store downtown, in downtown Gainesville that was popular with students at the University of Florida in the earliest years when the, the university came to Gainesville in 1906 and like maybe the first 10 or 15 years. So his Miller's store was, was very popular. So the story goes that Philip Miller went up to Charlottesville, Virginia to visit his son Austin, who was a law student at the University of Virginia. And while he was up there, he went to a store that sold University of Virginia Cavalier paraphernalia, you know, pennants and that kind of thing. And he wanted to buy pennants uh, for the university. And so they went to a store and said, yeah, sure, we can, we can buy these for you. And the, you know, the, the, the manufacturer asked, uh, first of all, what were the school colors? He said orange and blue. And then he said, what are the mascot? And we didn't have a mascot, so they came up with a mascot. So that was the story when I got here, that it was the Millers who, who originated the Gator mascot. Let me come back to the Millers in a second. So I was doing research on something, I can't even remember what, and I came across this story where Roy Corbett, who was up, had been on the football team in the early years, said that the inspiration for the nickname was this guy, Neil Bogator Storter. And I said, oh God, this is, this is interesting. This is another story here. This is not the Miller story. This is another story. So I decided to do research on that. And I said, what, is, what does the archives say about this? What, what is in the archives that might tell me uh, whether or not the Miller story or the Bogator story is the accurate story? So I found, eventually found, I couldn't find any explanation for the Gator nickname, but I did find the year that the, the, um, the mascot was adopted. It was October 1911, and it occurred during a trip to South Carolina where the football team went up to South Carolina and played both Clemson and uh, South Carolina. And it was on that trip that the mascot was accepted. So I had a date, and that date seemed to confirm the Storter story because Neil Storter had been the captain of the 1911 football team. So I thought, okay, this is it. I've, I've got it now. This is the story. We know it happened in 1911, not 1907 with the Millers. And then I found another explanation. So <laughs> this one came from Storter himself. And he said, no, it was, he, he was not the inspiration. He said it occurred, first he said it was in Georgia and he said it was on a, uh, they were playing Mercer in Macon, and the Macon papers had said that Georgia was being invaded by these alligators from Florida. So I checked out the, uh, the Macon newspapers and found out that was not the case. Uh, they didn't say anything about that. In fact, they referred to the team as the boys from the Everglades, which was weird because Neil Storter was actually grew up in Everglade, which is now Everglade City, so he actually grew up in the Everglades. Um, but then later on, he changed the story and he said it wasn't, it wasn't Georgia, it was South Carolina. And I'm going, oh, oh, South Carolina, that was the, you know, this time he got it right. So now we have a third story. Um, later on, I found a fourth story <laughs> uh, from uh, uh, the guy who was, I'm blanking on his name, uh, Graham, who was the uh, business manager of the University of Florida. And he was asked you know, at one point, he was asked by Sam Proctor, in fact. And he said there was no real story, you know, they're behind it. He just said it's a natural nickname, you know. There are gators on campus. We have gators on Lake Alice, right? So there was no mystery to why, you know, we're called the gators. But anyway, I wrote this article um, and explained all the different stories and, you know, basically said, well, we really don't know why we're called the gators. But it wasn't Austin Miller and his and Philip Miller and their penance. But that story's interesting because I thought, well, okay, they just made that up, right? They're, 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 not, they're not telling the truth. But here's the problem. According to the story, the manufacturer asked them the school colors, right? And they said orange and blue. And this was in 19, 1907. 1907, the school colors weren't orange and blue. They were probably blue and gold. But there was a lot of confusion about that second color because a lot of people thought it was orange. <laughs> So people thought it was orange. And apparently it's impossible that the Millers, it wasn't the, the mascot, he just misremembered. It wasn't the, the mascot that, 
that they influenced, they may have influenced the school colors. Because here, if they said blue and orange, and now they're selling blue and orange pennants and people are buying them, then you can, you know, what's going to happen? People are going to say, yeah, the school colors are orange and blue, right? <laughs> so that's my theory. No. Um, there's also mystery about the, the, the again, the origins of uh, the orange and blue. Uh, somebody said, and again, this comes from a world history, from memory, somebody said that uh, they took the orange, um, no, they took the blue from the, the old University of Florida in uh, Lake City and uh, the orange from the East Florida Seminary. And that turned out to be not true because they had already established that the schools, school colors were going to be blue, or, blue and gold or blue and orange prior to us moving to Gainesville. So I knew that story wasn't true. But it's possible that Miller may have the Millers may have influenced the name, and that's why we have orange and blue rather than blue and gold. That's so interesting. I, I'm agnostic as to <laughs> <laughs> our colors, blue and gold. Or I'm sure we'd be fine if they were blue and gold. And, um, but I, you know, I'm, I also realize that I can't imagine University of Florida being blue and gold, right? It has to be orange and blue. Right? So. And so continuing on this theme of University of Florida history, mm -hmm. um, I know you worked on the task force um, on University of Florida's relationship with race. Yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, could you talk a bit about how you got into the project and the research you produced and what challenges you faced or what interesting founding, findings you made? Well, yes, I was asked to join that committee, and I did. Um, and uh, we did a lot of research on uh, trying to find you know, connections with our past. Uh, that task force was preceded by a class. Uh, John Sensback had a class uh, about a year or two prior to that. And a lot of the people, including John Sensback and a couple of his students, were also involved in the task force. And they had already done research on our connections with slavery during the period where the East Florida Seminary was in Ocala, Florida. And that would have been in a period before the Civil War. Then after the Civil War, the East Florida Seminary moved to Gainesville. And there was very little documentation on that. And I, you know, I attended the first class that he did with the, uh, with the students, and I said, look, this is all we have from the, uh, the, uh, the East Florida Seminary in Cali. One document, one document. But that one document supplied them with a whole bunch of names of students and faculty. And from that, they were able to like trace, they were able to look at census records and figure out who these people were. You know, did they own slaves? Yes, pretty much everybody uh, who attended the East Florida Seminary in Cali their family were part of the slave-owning uh, population in Florida. Uh, and some of them, and many of them, were very prominent uh, uh, in, in the area. Um, and you know, there's this distinct, they found out it was a very distinct possibility that slave labor was used uh, to, to build the campus. It was only got one building, but um, those, there were, that slaves were used uh, in the construction of the campus. Um, so from that, there was this interest in what other ties uh, to our past uh, revolve, uh, uh, related to African Americans um, you know, before, uh, uh, before integration and also after integration. And so I was part of the task force that dealt, dealt with a period after the University of Florida moved to Gainesville. So it would be like the period from 1906 to the period of integration. And then there was a, another group that did after that. And there was another group who did with, who uh, dealt with the period before uh, the university moved to Gainesville. And uh, we found a number of materials, but not as much as we hoped for. It's very hard to document uh, that period of time uh, because you know, it was before integration. There are no students here, no black faculty. But there are a lot of uh, black employees who work for the University of Florida. And their lives are just, they're not documented to any great extent. We didn't, it's not something, those are not the type of records that we kept. Uh, 
neither you know during the period where I was you know in the university archives or even before you know those kind of records people didn't consider them important so they're the type of records that would have been destroyed um, so we really don't have a really good idea of what you know the, how people how African Americans Americans experienced their time at the University of Florida uh, during that period of time. So, but we did some research. We found some materials uh, that were relevant to the period, and also dealing with attitudes at the time. You know, the influence of uh, organizations like the United Daughters of the Confederacy, and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, they were, you know, they were a factor here. Uh, they were a factor at every southern institution, any southern college and university. Uh, they were very much involved in the firing of uh, Enoch Banks, who was a history professor here, who had written an article that uh, indicated that it was the South that was responsible for the Civil War, not the North. That didn't go over well with the United Daughters. Uh, and they attacked him, and he was forced to resign his position here. So materials like that. Uh, and they, you know, the daughters were also involved in scholarships and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. What challenges did you face sort of both in, well, you mentioned during research, but sort of releasing that um, task what? force? So were there any challenges associated with like releasing the task force? Was there, was there any pushback from the administration? Um, how do you feel like the effects of the report? Were? I, I don't think that the report was given that's you know, there, were no, there was no pushback in terms of the report itself. We did a good job with the report. The report, report was issued. Nothing was really done with the report. Uh, afterwards, you know, we, we attempted, particularly Paul Ortiz, uh, you know, organized an event, you know, to, to the public where we presented our findings. Um, but that did not come from the administration. I mean, it, they, it's, it's a lot of these reports, I think, end up, you know, in the files somewhere. I, I don't think the university, we're, we're not dealing with a period in our, of our history right now where, uh, you know, where the administration is going to deal with these issues in a serious way. Yeah. And um, could you, like, describe the University of Florida's, like, relationship with race? Just in general. Yeah, I don't I mean, think I, I can do that. That's a huge topic. But oh, gosh. Yeah, like the integration hard to process, do. specifically. Uh, you know, uh, I, I've given talks on this. And uh, I've always kind of like focus on like the first 10 or 15 years after integration. So the University of Florida was the first of the public uh, universities in the state of Florida to accept an African American. That was George Stark in the College of Law in 1958. Um, but from 1958 until the early 1970s, there were only like a couple of hundred African-American students attending the University of Florida in any given year. So we have this period from 1958 until the early 1970s where we're, you know, there's like this, we're nominally integrated. You know, oh, we've integrated, but we're not really integrated. I mean, we're not accepting students. We're discouraging students from attending the University of Florida. We're like one of the last Southern, um, football teams <laughs> to accept African Americans. I mean, today, can you imagine that? You know, it's just it's, it's insane. But uh, yeah, uh, we did not encourage uh, uh, African Americans to attend here until the federal government got involved uh, in the early 1970s. And so we had to uh, implement an affirmative action plan. And that only came about after uh, African American students here actually revolted and uh, sat down in uh, President O'Connell's office and demanded that uh, certain changes be made. Um, those changes weren't made at the time, but it had a very dramatic impact on the culture here. There was a lot of sympathy uh, in the student population with, with black students here in the early 1970s. I wasn't here, I was in Tallahassee during that same period of time. And I saw what was going on in Tallahassee with just the changes in attitudes. Uh, in Tallahassee, FSU went through the same thing. When I got there in 71, there, I, I, it was really rare to see an African American in a classroom. Could you um, describe the process of incorporating women into the university? 
um, in like the co-educational process? And well, that was a lot easier because uh, the Buckman Act stipulated that Buckman Act 1905 stipulates that uh, the, uh, stipulated that the University of Florida would be an all-male institution. Uh, the Florida State College would become the state college for women. So we were gender divided, gender segregated from 1905 until 1947. It was never popular. Uh, it wasn't popular among the students, but it was also not popular. Uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it caused a lot of problems because it was very difficult to maintain gender segregated higher education, which meant essentially to duplicating education. You have one university over here and another university over there for women. I mean, it, it's, it didn't make any sense. And it, it caused a lot of problems, uh, particularly caused problems after World War II uh, when we had this explosion uh, of students. Every, every college and university in the United States of America after World War II experienced this, this sudden onrush of GIs entering uh, through the GI Bill, entering colleges and universities. None of us, none of us were prepared for it. Um, the University of Florida accepted as many GIs as it could and simply said, we, we don't have any more room. So FSU, the Florida State College for Women, ended up accepting for one year GI, male GIs. And they were allowed to attend Florida State. Um, but in order to maintain the fiction, they were actually enrolled as University of Florida students, but they were actually attending classes at Florida State. But the next year, the state legislature finally decided, yeah, this isn't working. We need two co-educational uh, colleges. So that came rather easy, I think. Uh, what was not, was not easy was the decision in 1905 to separate this, the genders. It just didn't make any sense. I mean, we'd, we'd been co-educational prior to 1905. So here's Florida going in the opposite direction as the rest of the nation. You know, the rest of the nation was already, had already moved towards co-education. There were only three universities in 1905 that prohibited women from attending the universities, and they were all in the South, Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia. So here it is in 1905, um, you know, Florida is deciding to join that small group. It, it never made any sense. It made sense to the, the authors of the Buckman Act because they thought, you know, there, there was this, politically it was impossible for the state of Florida not to have two colleges. A lot of it had to do with the geography of Florida, which is weird, you know, <laughs> that weird geography. It's like, it's very difficult to move around. You know, even today, to get from Pensacola to Key West, it takes a long time. But in those days, in 1905, it, you know, transportation was very uh, inadequate in the state of Florida. So it was kind of inevitable there were going to be two universities, two colleges uh, in the state in 1905. Also, there was a problem with the Seminary Act of 1851, which stipulated that there had to be two seminaries. And they couldn't repeal that law because the state law was attached to two, two or three federal laws. So in order to repeal that, they would have had to repeal the federal laws. And of course, the state of Florida can't do that. It's nullification. You can't, can't do that. Um, so there had to be two colleges. And the idea was that, OK, what we'll do, we'll make, them, we'll make one school for women and the other school for men, and then they won't compete with each other. But they did. So but there was, in the, the idea in 1905 was, well, OK, the women won't be so demanding. <laughs> they won't, they'll, they'll accept less. They didn't. The other problem there was that, and then the authors of the, uh, the Buckman Act really, they realized it at a certain point and then realized, yeah, we'd create a dilemma. Part of it had to do with the education of teachers. At that time, 80% of uh, people attending normal schools or uh, teacher colleges were women. And if you're gonna have a gender segregated uh, system, that means 80% of those students are now going to be at the State College for Women. So what ends up happening is the State College for Women was larger than the University of Florida because there were all these women attending education classes. And with that came more money 
The State College for Women, their budget was actually higher than the University of Florida's for like 20 years, maybe even longer, because there were more, more students there than there were at the University of Florida. That wasn't the intention. They're, they're, they thought they were gonna create this system where the, 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 the male school was gonna be the dominant school, you know, and gonna, it was gonna get all the attention, it was gonna get all the money. Didn't end up that way though. And then afterwards, and then by the 1920s, you know, women are, you know, now, it was this 1905, that was before suffrage, you know, now women have the right to vote, and now women are thinking, yeah, I wanna be a lawyer, I wanna be an engineer, I wanna be all these things. So yeah, it was, it, it was never a good idea. <laughs> It did, not, it did not work out well, uh, gender segregation, so. Yeah, so last year you released a book called The Making of Florida's Universities. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could you talk a bit about the book, the thesis you put forward, and the research you conducted for that book? That research went on for years and years and years. Uh, I, I can't even say when it really actually began, um, um, because I, the whole time I was the university archivist and I was the university historian, I was writing all these things. At some point I realized there's a lot of history um, involved at the University of Florida that's really interesting. There are a lot of political struggles going on uh, in the early years of our, our history that, are, that were never documented. Uh, one of the first things I did is I did an article on President Andrew Sled and all the political trauma that he experienced and during his five years as president of the University of Florida. <clears throat> he was here, he actually was the first, last president of the old University of Florida in Lake City. He had to deal with the whole transition from Lake City to, to Gainesville, which was very traumatic. Uh, we're the only state in modern history to, uh, to abandon a campus of a state university and then move it somewhere else. Think about that, that's crazy, you don't do that. You don't, you don't just move a campus, you know. Um, but he had to deal with that, he had to deal with a lot of other issues uh, and just got a lot of uh, pushback from uh, politicians. Uh, he was the mortal enemy of uh, William Holloway, who was the superintendent of public instruction and uh, he created a lot of enemies, trying to do the right thing, really. Uh, but he, he was very successful in getting things done during the very short period of time that he was here. He, you know, he, he increased uh, the standards for admission. Uh, when he came here, he only needed a 10th grade education to enter the university. He, he raised that to 11th grade, he wanted to go higher. We had a preparatory school here for many, many years, simply because there wasn't enough high schools in the state of Florida to supply students. So the university had to have its own prepped, uh, preparatory school. Uh, he kind of cut back on that. He didn't want the University of Florida to do that. He needed to focus on uh, higher education, not secondary education. I added a number of programs. He was very successful in, um, there had been problems before he came here with the agricultural program. Uh, the university was misspending some of the money. Um, he, he dealt with that, he solved that issue. Uh, Dealt with a number of issues, but he had a lot of political enemies and uh, was forced to resign in 1909. And so I ended up writing an article about that. And I realized oh, there's a lot going on here that we don't know about at the university. There's a lot of political turmoil. So I followed that up and I started looking at Murphy's papers. And I had a really low you know, esteem for, for President Murphy at first, but then I realized, no, this guy was going through the same thing same things as uh, Andrew Sled, even though the politicians really wanted Murphy to be president, and Murphy did a few things that maybe you know he shouldn't have done in order to become president in 1909. Uh, but he had the same kind of standards that Andrew Sled had, and he got into a lot of problems with politicians as well. Uh, so the book really revolves around the political struggles to create a state university system. It wasn't just UF. The book is not just about UF, but it's also about Florida State and also about FAMU as well. But as bad as Andrew Sled had it, as bad as Albert Murphy had it, there was nothing compared to what Nathan Young experienced at Florida A&M and what the students there had to put up with. And one of the chapters deals with a uh, period in around the mid-1920s during the administration of Governor Kerry Hardy, where uh, Governor Hardy and uh, the Florida Board of Education decided to basically end 
college education for African Americans at FAMU and force the students there to take vocational classes and force them to do labor, unpaid labor, while they were taking these vocational classes. Needless to say, that didn't go over well with either President Young or uh, with the student body there. Uh, president Young was eventually forced out. The president, the interim president that was appointed afterwards, had tried to like, implement uh, the programs that the Board of Education was demanding. Uh, the students uh, first they issued a petition, signed a petition saying, you know, this is unacceptable. Uh, that was basically ignored by the administration, by the uh, Florida Board of Control. Uh, then there was a strike. The strike was put down. Everybody thought, okay, strike's over now. We can go back to normal. Instead, the students start burning down buildings. And they burned down three buildings, uh, including the administration building, the mechanics hall, which was where the vocational classes were taught, which obviously was the main target. Um, one of the dorm women's dormitories, they attempted to burn other buildings. Eventually, peace was restored. A new president came in and basically undid everything that Governor Hardy and the Florida Board of Education had implemented. And there was like no protest from the state <laughs> whatsoever, because they, they had just gone through this period of, with the strike and the buildings being burned down. And by that time, everybody wanted peace. So uh, President Lee just, just did away with everything that you know, the, the, the Board of Education had, had uh, implemented. Uh, and so the students actually won. It's an amazing period of our, our history. And we don't really talk about that. You know, when I, when I started reading about the, what about the buildings being burned down, I was like, what? Why has nobody ever talked about this before? And people do know about it at FAMUs. You know, they're, it's known as the, the Great Fires. <laughs> but nobody has ever written about it. So, but yeah, that's kind of an indication of what the book is about. It's about the political struggles that went on to finally create the University of Florida and Florida State and FAMU. And um, transitioning to the work you're working on now on William Carlton, could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, so I came back to Carlton. So it was so interesting because my, one of my first jobs as the university archivist, assistant university archivist, was to process the Carlton papers. Um, and I, uh, so I, I got reintroduced to American institutions. And I, as I was processing the collection, I just realized this guy's an amazing person. You know, why, does, why has no one ever written about Carlton? He was very influential uh, in terms of uh, the discussions regarding American foreign policy after World War II. Uh, he basically designed the American Institutions Social Sciences Program uh, for University College. Um, he was also involved in, uh, he was an expert on uh, Southern politics and national politics. Uh, I forget how many, I think, he, I think it's 314. There were 314 publications in his vita. Now, a lot of them were not in scholarly publications, peer-reviewed publications. A lot of them were in various uh, literary journals. Uh, gave speeches that were attended by thousands of people. Like as I said before, his classes were attended by hundreds of people, hundreds of students. Um, so, so I just thought somebody needs to write a history. And I always thought that somebody would, but nobody ever did. So I decided after retirement that I would write a, uh, a, a biography of Carlton. And yeah, that's what I'm doing now. Really interesting guy. One of the things that I realized as I was processing the collection, um, so prior to getting the collection, uh, Professor Doherty, Jack Doherty, uh, who was the executor of his estate, Carlton's estate, he was responsible for, uh, shall I say, I don't want to say censoring the papers, but going through the papers and getting rid of anything that might have been uh, indicative of his private life. And probably did a pretty thorough job, uh, but he missed a couple of letters. And while I'm doing the, while I'm looking through his letters, I realize, wait a minute, this guy is talking, you know, he's talking about being attracted to men as well as women. And when he's writing this letter to Carlton about this, and I thought, wait a minute, Carlton is gay. So I started talking to some of the 
my colleagues who had been here for years, like Liv Alexander, who was head of the Florida History Collection, I said, do you know Carlton was gay? And everybody said, yeah, of course. Everybody knew that. <laughs> everybody knew that. So uh, that was no big news. But, uh, but then I found out, and so then it came up, you know, we had the Johns Committee investigations here uh, in the late 1950s. He was here. So I was always like, was he implicated in that? Turns out he was. And it actually may have factored into his retirement, early retirement in 1962. Um, but I was never, so in addition to having the Carlton's papers, we also, we also have the papers of um, Gene Barrow. And um, Barrow was also gay and was a librarian and also taught in creative writing. And Barrow and Carlton had been lovers at one time. And in the correspondence, uh, in Barrow's correspondence, I found all these letters uh, where I found these letters where, where Carlton is saying, hey, we were supposed to have burned our, our correspondence or gotten rid of our correspondence. Uh, Carlton did, but apparently Barrow didn't. So you know, before that, it was just like you know, hearsay as to whether or not you know, Carlton was gay. Everybody knew he was, but you really couldn't prove it. But now we have the Barrow papers. And we, we know, but it was also interesting too because within the Barrow Papers, we really get a sense of what was going on with the Johns Committee and the, uh, the, the horror and the you know the, just the panic in the gay community uh, at that time. So, yeah, I got a, I had a sense of you know what he was going through. And I never thought that that you know that I was going to be writing gay history or anything. Uh, but now I feel realize I really have to tell that story as well as part of the story. Could you touch a bit? on the Johns Committee and sort of the relationship UF has had with sort of queer yeah. students? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, a lot has been written on the Johns Committee. Um, the Johns Committee was originally established uh, as the House Legislative Investigation Committee, and their primary focus was supposed to be uh, communist influence in the civil rights movement. This is in 1959. There's not a lot of communists in, in the state of Florida in 1959. There's no communist influence in the state of Florida. Uh, in the civil rights movement at that time. Um, there might have been earlier on, but there wasn't at that time. So basically, they came up with nothing. And Charlie Johns, the head of the committee, was also the uh, head, of the, uh, head of the Senate. Um, he needed a rationale for continuing uh, the committee. So instead of looking at the civil rights movement and communists, they decided to go after gays and lesbians. Um, they did investigations at, they started at FAMU. Again, they're looking for communists as well. Uh, and then they eventually moved on to the University of Florida. And the impact of the University of Florida was much more dramatic than it was at the other institutions. They ended up firing, I think, 13 uh, faculty and staff. We still don't know how many students were involved. You know, numbers have ranged from like 50 to 70. I've seen various numbers. There's no way to tell uh, because in those days, the concept of in locum parentis was still in effect. Um, if you were under the age of 21 and you were still considered a minor, you were still considered a child. So the university would not necessarily have expelled you. They would have dealt with you the same way as your parents would. So you know, if your parents found out you were gay in 1959, they might throw you out of the house, or they might say, you know, you need to see a psychiatrist uh, because at that time, sexual homosexuality was dealt with as a mental illness, and so it's hard to say how many students were affected because we know that some students were expelled. Their parents probably said, yeah, expel them. Uh, but we also probably, there was probably a lot of number of parents, oh, well, they need help. <laughs> Go see the psychiatrist. Interestingly, the psychiatrist at the, uh, the infirmary was no fan of the Johns Committee. He was a very vocal opponent of, uh, he said there was more problems with the heterosexuals than the homosexuals, so, which was true, <laughs> far more. Um, but yeah, it had a very dramatic impact on the University of Florida, and it was a real, Black eye in terms of uh, you know our rep the university's reputation, you know. So, uh, 
Could yeah. you speak a bit about student activism and like important episodes of student activism that has affected UF's history? Like I know Black Thursday yeah. was like we alluded about to previously. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think there's always been activism at the University of Florida. Sometimes it's been rather muted. There was a certain amount of left-wing activity prior to World War II. Uh, not very much. Uh, but uh, in the 1960s, we had our fair share of student activism. We were sometimes referred to as the Berkeley of the South. Um, there were a number of students, uh, white students mostly, uh, really all white students uh, in the early 1960s, uh, who were involved in the civil rights movement, a number of whom were arrested and various demonstrations uh, in Ocala and Gainesville, but also they were heavily involved with the, the demonstrations in St. Augustine, which were very dramatic. Um, so there was that. Uh, a lot of those students became involved with the anti-war movement. So you had a lot of anti-war movement. Uh, we had a number of strikes um, and protests at the University of Florida uh, against the war, uh, far more than, than at Florida State. I knew there was always this kind of jealousy while I was at Florida State. You know, well, the demonstrations at the UF were always bigger. So um, but there was a certain level of uh, uh, activism here, uh, more than what you would expect at a Southern University. Of course, by the 1960s and 1970s, the state of Florida was changing. We we're no longer really a deep South state. I think throughout, you know, for the first part of our history, we were, we were a typical deep South state, just a lot, lot like Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia. Uh, in terms of attitudes and conservatism uh, in the student body. But after World War II, we had this massive influx into the state of Florida. A lot of GIs moved to, former GIs moved to Florida. They had trained in Florida and they liked Florida. So there's this, you know, thousands of people moving to Florida. The demographics are changing at the university. So by the 1970s, Native Southern whites no longer dominated the culture. They were, they were in a sense a minority because most of the students are now coming from Central and South Florida, not from North Florida. Um, and they, they have no, they had no affinity with uh, Dixie. <laughs> they had no affinity for uh, Southern culture. Um, and yeah, so there were a lot of changes going on and in the, in the student body as well. So things were different here in the 1960s and 1970s than there would have been at Georgia or Mississippi or Alabama, uh, simply because the, the state was changing. And um, have you had any personal experience seeing that change in sort of the decades you've been working as the UF archivist historian? Well, I saw a lot of changes while I was here. A lot of them were cosmetic. <laughs> uh, I'm looking out this window right now <laughs> Uh, the university did not look good when I got here in uh, 83. I mean, it was like the landscaping was terrible. A lot of the buildings were run down. Uh, Flint Hall was uh, abandoned. Peabody Hall was abandoned. Uh, Floyd Hall was abandoned. So we had these three derelict buildings that you couldn't even go into. Um, it did not look pretty. Um, the plaza was kind of trashy. Uh, things changed, uh, uh, I said about 10 years after I got here, I started noticing changes on campus in terms of the appearance of the campus. A lot more uh, uh, concern with how the, ca the campus looked. Um, so there was that. It's not a very pretty campus. <laughs> I enjoy walking on campus now. Uh, changes also, again, in the student body, again. I mean, these, these, these were going on before I came here, but, but you know, they were still going on uh, uh, after I came here. Uh, a lot, uh, well, more foreign students, for one. Uh, I was here during the period of time when a lot of we started to receive, a lot of Chinese students have started coming to the University of Florida. Um, yeah, a lot of demographic changes, far more. Uh, Latinx students now than when I came here in 83. Um, gays are now openly gay. <laughs> they weren't so much in 83. Uh, you started to see that though. You could see the, uh, uh, the LGBTQ community coming out more in the early 1980s. 
So there was that. A lot of changes with the sports program. <laughs> when I came here in 83, football team was not very good. Uh, basketball team was even worse. Uh, now today, you know, things have changed with that. Of course, now, uh, now in the year 2024, football team is not doing so well. But, <laughs> um, but you know, I saw, I went through all those changes too, you know. Yeah. I'm a big basketball fan, more a basketball fan than football, so those two back-to-back -back years for the football, the basketball team were just wonderful for me. Um, yeah, a lot of different changes have occurred at the university since I came here. Could you describe U.S. relationship with sort of other racial minorities beyond the black-white dichotomy? So you mentioned Latin students as well as Asian students. Yeah. So like, were they not allowed to attend UF sort of in the years of segregation? No, what no, absolutely in? not. And yeah. in fact, you know, uh, people of color did attend the University of Florida, but before integration. Um, the, the laws related to Jim Crow only applied to people of African descent, the, you know, the, the descendants of uh, formerly enslaved people. Uh, that's how you defined colored in those days. That was the term that was used, colored. That we, today we use people of color, but that didn't refer necessarily to what they were talking about during the period of Jim Crow. So there were a few Asian students here. There's an interesting letter in Andrew Sled's um, correspondence where it came from the uh, a consular office officer, uh, British consular officer in Calcutta. And he was asking whether a very dark-skinned uh, Bengali student could attend the University of Florida. And Sled replied, well, yes, he could, but he didn't think he would be comfortable here. He didn't think he would be accepted here. And he would advise, the, that, student, he would advise that student to attend a college elsewhere in the United States, outside the South. So you know, we did, there were people of color who attended. There was, you know, uh, there was a fairly significant Latin uh, Cuban population in Tampa, Spanish population as well. So we had that. You know, you, you look at the yearbooks and you do see Spanish names. You do see students coming from Tampa and other, other places as well. So they were here. And we always had a, a larger Jewish population than other southern uh, universities. And then after World War II, it just explodes, of course, because a lot of the GIs who are moving to Florida are, are Jewish. And now we have the largest concentration of Jewish students of any public university in the nation, which totally amazed me when I heard that the first time. I just said, what? How is that possible that the University of Florida, knowing its history and knowing our background, that we now have more Jewish students than any other public university in the, in the country? That just it, you know, tells you what's happening in the state of Florida. Could you elaborate a bit on the U.S. history with Jewish students and Jewish faculty? Was there a lot of anti-Semitism? Absolutely, there was a lot of anti-Semitism. And it took forever for Blue Key to accept Tept, the first, uh, the first Jewish fraternity as part of Florida Blue Key. But they eventually relented. But it was after World War II. And they realized, yeah, a lot of Jews are moving <laughs> to Gainesville, Florida, attending the University of Florida. And the Florida Blue Key wanted to keep its status. Uh, as the powerhouse behind student government, then they were going to have to accept Jewish students. So they accepted TEP, and a few, a few years later, they accepted the Pi Lambs as well. Um, yeah, so there, there was a lot of anti-Semitism before World War II, and, well, and some after World War II, but not as noticeable after World War II. But yeah, uh, Jewish students here probably had a rough time uh, in terms of their acceptance here. Uh, but we've always had a Jewish presence at uh, even, well, not year one, but the year two, there was like one Jewish student. <laughs> Jakey Jacobson was our first Jewish student. He came from Jacksonville. So, yeah. but the numbers have increased over the years, obviously. So, could you touch a bit on Florida Blue Key and could you elaborate a bit on Florida Blue Key's role on campus historically? Well, they were originally. Uh, they were organized in 1923, I think, right, right before uh, homecoming that year. And originally, they were, it, was an, it was an honorary organization consisting of uh, the, the, political, the student political leaders uh, of the time. Uh, Blue Key was given responsibility for homecoming the next year. 
and Blue Key has, ha has basically run homecoming since then. Uh, but eventually they became uh, very powerful. Uh, it's always been dominated by the Greek organizations. Um, and pretty much every student body president elected uh, between 1923 and the, the present has been a, Florida, a member of Florida Blue Key. Uh, but there have been a few years where there have been exceptions to that, particularly in the 70s. Um, yeah, so it's always been a very powerful student organization, uh, but also an organization that's been willing to adapt and change and accept new people. So sometimes they were forced to, as in the case with women. So they were told, no, <laughs> you cannot be a male-only orga male orga organization. So they immediately started bringing in the sororities. So that was their way they, they solved that situation. All right. Um, and sort of, maybe this is a, a bit more punchy of a question, but yeah. who would you say is your favorite university president, or who maybe did the best job, and who would be your least favorite yeah, university I'm not going to go with the least. Uh, <laughs> too many? <laughs> uh, yeah, probably too many. No. Uh, that's a hard one. I have a tremendous respect for the first two presidents, Sled and Murphy, just through what, what they went through. I have a lot of respect for President Tigard as well, because he was here for like 20 years. He dealt with the Great Depression. He came here in 1928. You know, Florida had just experienced the, the bust of 1927, where land values just plummeted in the state of Florida. But the state was just about to recover from that. Then the Great Depression hits in 1929. So he's here during the Great Depression. He's here during the war. And he has to deal with all that. Um, but yet he managed to uh, make some major improvements uh, at the university. He, prior to his arrival, it was basically instructional. The faculty here were not required to publish. Uh, many of them did, but it was not a requirement. It was basically about education, um, not research. Very little research was done here outside of agriculture. It's always been that, right? Um, but the engineering programs were, were strengthened during his, period, during his time. Uh, we have the first two uh, research centers outside of engineering and agriculture with the uh, uh, Bieber, the uh, Bureau of Economic and Business Research, which uh, focuses on research and uh, on economics in Florida. That was created during his tenure, and also the, the predecessor to the Center for Latin American Studies, which is very important on the university. Uh, that began during his period of time, uh, during his tenure as well. Uh, he had been very much influenced by Pan-Americanism, and that was one of the first things he wanted to do when he came here. He wanted to establish some kind of Latin American program uh, at the university, so he did that. Um, after that, Miller, Miller was okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, died of a massive heart attack, though, and kind of put the university in a bind because uh, at the time, Charlie Johns was the acting governor. And so it became a political problem. Um, the person that it was actually picked to succeed Miller was uh, Philip Davidson from uh, University of Louisville. University of Louisville was the first university below the, Southern, below, below the Mason-Dixon line to integrate. And when Charlie Johns found out about that, he did not like that. He said, nope, I am not signing pay warrants for that guy. So Davidson withdrew, and we went through a period of time where we had a long period of time where we had an interim president, and eventually we settled on uh, J. Wayne Wrights. Uh, it's kind of a compromise. Wrights, I don't know. Yeah, so there were some issues with Wrights in terms of his response to uh, the Johns Committee, uh, also his response to the anti-war protest, uh, anti protesters and the civil rights protesters as well. Um, same thing with O'Connell, but I'll give O'Connell credit. He did try. You know, one of the first things he did, he came here, he realized that there's a lot of turmoil going on uh, in universities throughout the country. And he came here in 69, I think. Um, and so he implemented measures to kind of like deal with that. He tried to start a dialogue with the student body. Uh, <clears throat> one of the big issues on college campuses was over 
free speech and you know speakers, that kind of thing. So he was O'Connell who decided that it wasn't called Accent at the time, but he decided Accent would be, stu be a student-run organization. Um, just a kind of a way of dealing with that, you know. Okay, let the students do it. Let the students pick who's going to speak here, and uh, not try to interfere with that. Uh, but on the other hand, he didn't handle the uh, Black Thursday demonstrations very well at all, uh, and he just made a, a bad situation even worse, uh, demanding that you know the students be be pr uh, pr prosecuted, whatever. Not prosecuted, but that you know they be you know held responsible for what they did. Uh, rather than giving him the amnesty, which is what he should have done, um, because their, their, their demands were legitimate. Uh, but O'Connell did not like turmoil, neither did Wrights. <laughs> uh, Wrights was definitely a kind of person who, you know, didn't like anybody upsetting, the, you know, the, uh, uh, the apple cart. You know, he, he liked things to be orderly. And that was actually good during the period of integration, because it could have been worse when George Stark arrived here. But Wright was one of those guys, like, you know, I'm not going to have any turmoil at my university. So in that period of time would have been, you know, people like the Klan, and people opposed to integration who would have created trouble. And he made sure that didn't happen. Not because he supported civil rights and thought it was a good idea to necessarily to integrate the university, but he just didn't want anything bad happening while, <laughs> while he was president. So uh, we'll stop there. <laughs> All right. And um, is there anything else about UF? Or why, why is UF history important to study? And why do you think university history in general is important to study? I don't think we study uh, the history of uh, higher education. Uh, I don't think it's been given its proper uh, respect. Uh, it's only in the last 20 years or so that we really have a number of people who are actually dealing with the history of higher education in a serious academic way. I know when I first when I first came here, I started to look at you know what's been written about the history of higher education. There's very little been written. A lot of it was very poor. Um, for example, um, the history of education, uh, the, the the not history, the history of uh, the teacher education, had never been dealt with. You know, I, I really you can't you couldn't find anything related to colleges of education and the education of teachers. A lot of it had to do with the fact with that, uh, for a number of years, uh, normal schools, uh, teacher colleges were subcollegiate. You didn't need a college degree to become a teacher. In fact, in the South, you know, eighth grade education was all that you needed to, to teach in on a school in the South. But even nationwide, I mean, we've, so many of our universities that were established as normal schools. But you would never know that when you look at uh, some of the early histories that were done of higher education in America. You know, they don't even mention normal schools. How can you not mention normal schools? You know, it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, I mean, Arizona State University began as a, as a normal school. Uh, UCLA, before it became part of the University of California, uh, was a normal school. So many of our schools began as normal schools. And it's an important part of the history of higher education, but it was always treated as like, yeah, it's not important. Yeah, it's important. So, but a lot has happened in the last 10 or 20 years where people are giving more emphasis to where we've come with education. And uh, a lot of histories in the, of the past were kind of adulatory, you know. They were like, oh, these are the wonderful history of the University of Florida, the University of Georgia. Never really looking at you know the politics behind uh, what was going on and some of the struggles uh, that were involved in, in education and looking at the darker side of higher education. That's being corrected now. So, but yeah, it's important. Um, it's it's now a rite of passage for the middle class, right? The upper middle class, middle class. So you have to go to college. It wasn't the case before World War II. You know, so very relatively fewer people uh, attended college. It was for only certain people. You know, it wasn't necessarily the rich either. 
I mean, it depended on what you wanted to do with your life. Nobody attended college unless you were going to you know, become a lawyer, going to go to, you know, you had to go to the College of Law. Um, you know, there were certain programs that if you, that were necessary, you went to college. After World War I, colleges also took on the, well, how do I really describe it, but uh, uh, you went to college not necessarily to learn anything, <laughs> but you went to college to meet people. It became a social thing, and uh, uh, that's very important too. And it still exists today. You know, you, a lot of people. You know, you go to college because your parents went to college, and you go to college to meet people, and you go to college to to, to meet people that might improve your, you know, to influence your life after you leave after you leave the university. Uh, so, yeah. How can we ignore higher education? So what makes the University of Florida's history um, significant and important? Well, it's different. Um, again, going back to being an all-male school from 1905 to 1947, it's an institution in the South, so we're dealing with all the, all the same issues that uh, other Southern universities dealt with. Um, it's Florida. It's, you know, I was born in Florida in 1953. It's not the same state. You know, I can remember for years and years, you know, the population was like four million, seven million or something like that. And then one day I realized, oh my God. <laughs> you know, we're, what are we now, the fourth, fifth largest state in the, in the union? God, who would imagine that? So yeah, with the University of Florida, with the university, uh, the largest university, well, not necessarily the largest in terms of pop student population, but certainly the largest in terms of programs and influence uh, in the state of Florida. So that's, that's important. We were not an important state prior to World War II. This was the backwater. <laughs> we were an underpopulated state and uh, not powerful politically. Uh, Claude Pepper was probably the first influential senator from Florida. I think the, prior to that, I'd, you know, we were not an influ influential state, even compared to other southern states. We're always vying with Mississippi <laughs> to see. You know, there was always these comparisons with Mississippi. Well, we're not as bad as Mississippi, you know? Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, things have changed dramatically in the state of Florida. So not always for the good, but it's interesting being in the state of Florida and watching what's going on. So. And so you retired from your position a few years ago. What led to that decision? Well, I remarried, first of all. Um, and I wanted to do something else, get on with my life. You know, I, had, I didn't retire early. I'd always envisioned that I would retire at the age of 70. I ended up retiring at the age of 69 and a half, so six months early. But uh, I don't know. I, enjoy, I, still en I was still enjoying what I was doing, and I enjoyed the, the atmosphere. But I just wanted to do other things. I wanted to travel, do more research. Being a librarian, and they, even, it was, even though you're on the faculty, your uh, research is not emphasized as much as it would be if you were in the history department or the English department. So I didn't have, you don't give you enough time to do research. So now I have time, more time to do research. I have more time to travel. So pure, just purely personal. Just wanted to get out, do something different. And what would you say? 38 of, years was enough. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say was the highlight of those 38 years you spent as UF historian? Like any particular moment that stands out to you? Uh, it was all the discovery. Um, just stupid little things sometimes. Um, I remember one of the things I did, because nobody else wanted to do it in the department, we have a very large audiovisual collection. In fact, we got some of our materials from this institution, from the Oral History Center. They were collecting materials, and they decided at some point they didn't want them anymore. They gave them to the library. So we have a very large uh, audiovisual collection. And we don't have an audiovisual archivist unfortunately, and nobody else wanted to do that, so I took it on the, the, the task of uh, preserving uh, all of our old films and videos. Um, other people have carried on the work since I've left, 
But uh, that was really interesting. Um, we discovered a number of things that we had here. Uh, tapes of, uh, uh, in one of our collections with Coretta Scott King. Um, and actually, the woman sitting next to you, <laughs> she, uh, she noticed that we had tapes related to Rosa Parks. In fact, they were misidentified as being part of oral history. And she sent me an email, so why is this, why does this say it's oral history? And I'm like, I don't know, what is this? Why is this here? You know, and I turned out, oh, it came from uh, the Haskins collection. <laughs> it was part of the Haskins collection at the, at the library. So we have tapes from, that Haskins did, uh, interviews with Rosa Parks. Um, and I believe they were in oral history at one time, but they were transferred to, uh, to the library. Um, but one of the things I found, and this is so, again, this is one of those silly things, one of those silly discoveries that you make as an archivist. I was going through old film from the 1960s. It was the 1966 Homecoming reels. They had the usual stuff, the parade and Gator Growl and all this stuff. And there was this footage of the 1966 Homecoming game with Auburn, which is famous. Because it was during this game that uh, Steve Spurrier kicked a field goal that won the game. And many people consider this the reason why he won the Heisman Trophy in 1967. And I'm watching this footage, and it was all color footage taken from the ground level. And the only footage we had of the kick was game footage taken from the top of the stadium, you know, little tiny guys down on the ground. And I thought, oh my god, maybe, maybe the kick will be included. And sure enough, there was the kick. I just got really excited. <laughs> I started screaming, it's the kick, it's the kick. I have it on color film, ground level footage. And people on the, you know, and my colleagues were like, what? <laughs> the what kick, what, what is this all about? You know, so, kind of things like that. You know, those are the highlights of my career. Just, you know, dealing with discovery, finding things that you didn't expect to find, uh, or sometimes you did expect to find. And then there are the cases where you don't find. Uh, there are so many disappointments, too. You know, oh, we've got this collection. It's going to contain information on this. And then you get it, and you go, it's not there. What happened to it, you know? Uh, so, but there were more discoveries than disappointments. So, and I got to deal with a variety of materials. That was good, too. I didn't do one thing my entire life. It was the university archivist, and then I worked with political collections. Uh, and I worked with a lot of the Latin American collections. Um, then I started working with audiovisual materials. You know, that was different. So that's good. Keeps you entertained. And it is a, it, being an archivist is entertaining. It can be. It can also be boring, too. Depends on where you work. But our, our collections here are very eclectic. They're just like all over the place. So one of the collections I processed was primarily in Hungarian. I don't speak a word of Hungarian or <laughs> read a word of Hungarian. Uh, but these are it was a collection that we received. It was a psychologist uh, who, from Hungary, who came to the United States, ended up in Florida in Orange Park. Uh, and we ended up with this collection. And I processed those papers. And one day, uh, I, I, somebody, I, I, I answered the phone. And some guy was speaking to me in a language I didn't understand. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't know what language you're speaking. And he, he says, well, aren't you the person who processed the, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, um, this collection? And, and I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm that guy. You know, and it's like, well, you know, how, how can you not speak Hungarian? It's, the whole collection's in Hungarian. I said, well, you know, as an archivist, after a while, you just get a feel for, for records. It doesn't matter what language there are in. You know, it just, it, you, know you can tell what, what this is, you know. And this, this is correspondence, and this is, this is uh, his research papers and all that. So, you know, I didn't have any problems, really. Uh, and a lot have been written about the guy anyway, so I was able to get information. And so I knew what I was looking at. But yeah, so, yeah. All right. And um, before we end the oral history interview, is there anything you want to touch on that hasn't been touched on before? I'm sure there is. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure there are many things that I could touch on uh, related to, I know well, I never really talked about my experiences in the library itself, uh, other than being an archivist. Uh, 
And I saw a lot of changes in the library. And you know, I, oh, I mentioned when I came here, I you know, it was required to get a library science degree that changed, but um, a, a lot has been improved in the library. When I got here, things were still in a very primitive state in many uh, respects in the library, uh, in terms of staffing. Um, it was very difficult during the 1980s. There wasn't a lot of money in the budget, um, and into the 1990s in terms of. Um, getting your budget increased. Uh, our department was understaffed for many, many, many years. Um, the library just did not want to put a lot of emphasis on special collections um, because they had other things, they had other priorities. Uh, we're a major research institution. You know, we have to have, that's, that's primary, you know, you have to support engineering, you have to support medicine, you have to support all these, you know, all these programs Special collections is special. It's different. You know, it's it's not so much about supporting the curriculum here, but the curriculum el elsewhere or just research in general. You know, so the library wasn't really willing to spend a lot of money uh, on special collections, and it was very difficult to hire staff. That's changed um, in more in recent years. Uh, we've acquired a lot more collections. Um, I mentioned I was the <clears throat> charge of uh, the political papers collections for a number of years. <clears throat> we, have a, we have one of the largest collections of political papers in the country. A lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, a lot of our prominent politicians attended the University of Florida because this was the University of Florida. They went here, they didn't go to Florida State. Bob Graham, Lawton Childs, all these people, they all attended the University of Florida um, and they left their papers here. And that was kind of a problem at first because we were receiving thousands of boxes from Lawton Childs and Bob Graham, and we don't have the staff to deal with that. So the records kind of they sat in a warehouse for, for decades. But we finally got around to hiring the people, and those papers are now available uh, to the public. But it took a while, and uh, yeah, there was a lot of infighting to a certain extent in the, in the library about you know, who is gonna get money, so. All right. It, was, it wasn't all fun. <laughs> there, there, were, there, were, there were some issues with uh, library administration in terms of getting the resources that we needed. Even some basic stuff like boxes, getting boxes and stuff like that. Had to fight for that, so. All right. Um, any final things to touch on other than that? We can always do a part two oral history interview as well. Well, if I think of anything, I'll let you know. If you think of something, I'm sure there were questions that you might have wanted to ask, or we can certainly do it again. So. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Carl. We appreciate it. Okay. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>